Sixty years after the Nuremberg Trials, a conference commemorating the living legacy of Robert H. Jackson. There is nobody at the conference who knew Robert Jackson any better than Whitney R. Harris. Whitney Harris was born in Seattle, Washington on August 12, 1912. He attended the University of Washington, graduating with an A.B. degree, magna cum laude, in 1933. He attended law school at the University of California, graduating with a Juris Doctor degree in 1936. He practiced law in Los Angeles, entered the United States Navy as an ensign shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor, served as a line officer, and remained in on inactive status until August 12, 1972. Toward the end of World War II, Whitney Harris was assigned by the Navy for special duty with the Office of Strategic Services. He was placed in charge of the investigation of war crimes in the European theater. In August 1945, Lieutenant Harris joined the staff of Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson in the trial of the major German war criminals in Nuremberg, Germany. He served as a prosecutor throughout the trial until October 1, 1946, and was primarily responsible for the prosecution of Ernst Kaltenbrunner, the Gestapo, and the SD. For his work at Nuremberg, he was awarded the Legion of Merit. He was there side by side with Justice Robert H. Jackson. By a young German law professor, Christoph Safferling, on the subject, a German perspective on Nuremberg and its legacy. Christoph was born in 1971. Think about it a quarter of a century after the judgment of Nuremberg. His subject and his age make me realize that the Nuremberg trial is now history, become historical, if not forgettable. On uh, September 8, 1900, powerful winds hurled thousands of tons of seawater over the city of Galveston, drowning 8,000 of its inhabitants and demolishing homes and buildings. This year, another tropical storm, Katrina, swept over New Orleans. Earlier in the year, a terrifying tsunami <coughs> whirled out of the Pacific and Indian Oceans engulfing shore establishments and drowning their inhabitants. Terrifying as these acts of nature have been, they are as gentle breezes compared to the assaults by man himself in the past century, where in the First World War nearly nine million persons died, and in the second, more than 25 million, of whom 5 million were murdered. Single atom bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki killed far more victims in minutes than Katrina could ever kill in New Orleans. While man may never be able to stem these tragedies of nature, he has only himself to blame for war and the dreadful aftermath of war. In all of history, the 20th century witnessed the gravest inhumanities and killings that man has ever perpetrated on man. It is hard to believe that the long road of civilization which man has trod could have led to the dreadful conflicts of World Wars I and II and the incredible crimes against humanity spawned by the latter. Last July, I was invited to deliver the keynote address at a conference commemorating the 60th anniversary of the Nuremberg trial. Speaking in the same courtroom where we tried the major German war criminals before the International Military Tribunal 60 years ago, I characterized the Nazi era as a dreadful dream from which Germany had awakened. 
The trial had exposed the cynicism and evil of the actors in that dream and had shown to the world the righteous course humanity must take to prevent aggressive war, war crimes, and crimes against humanity in the years and centuries to come. The challenge of the 21st century is to ensure the preservation and enforceability of these profound principles of international law. Ten years ago, I had been invited by the mayor of Nuremberg to participate in an earlier conference on the Nuremberg trial. I was the only former prosecutor present and delivered the opening address. It was highly emotional then, as it was this year, to realize that after the passage of so many years, the German people, and particularly the citizens of Nuremberg itself, had come to recognize that the hard work which we did at Nuremberg in convicting the Nazi war criminals and in advancing the principles of international law had significantly contributed to world peace and tranquility. Three bronze plaques adorned the lintel above the doorway inside the entry to courtroom 600 where the trial took place. The center plaque represents human frailty in the offering by Eve of the apple to Adam. On one side is the Roman fasces for authority, and on the other, a kneeling figure holding a sword representing justice. In that courtroom, 60 years ago, justice vanquished authority. The genesis of the Nuremberg trial was the Moscow Conference of October 1943, at the conclusion of which a statement was issued by President Roosevelt, Prime Minister Churchill, and Premier Joseph Stalin declaring the determination of the three powers to hold individuals responsible for crimes committed by them in the course of World War II. The statement warned that officers and men and members of the Nazi party who were responsible for or took a consenting part in atrocities, massacres, or executions would be punished by joint decision of the Allies. The statement concluded, most assuredly, the three Allied powers will pursue them to the uttermost ends of the earth and will deliver them to their accusers in order that justice may be done. Five months later, President Roosevelt further declared, in one of the blackest crimes in all of history, begun by the Nazis in the days of peace and multiplied by them a hundred times in time of war, the wholesale systematic murder of, of the Jews of Europe goes on unabated every hour. It is therefore fitting that we should again proclaim our determination that none who participate in these acts of savagery shall go unpunished. As Greg said, I served as a line officer in the United States Navy throughout the war. Toward the end of the war, I was uh, transferred to the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, and placed in charge of the investigation of war crimes in the European theater. And I was engaged in this assignment when representatives of the Allied powers met in London for the purpose of drafting an agreement for the trial of the top leaders of Nazi Germany. I was invited to join the American prosecution staff and was in the first group of prosecutors to go to the site of the trial, Nuremberg, Germany, in August 1945. As Greg said, I was assigned the case against the Gestapo and SD and Ernst Kaltenberg, the chief of the Reich, uh, main security officer, RSHA, and presented in court the first case against any individual defendant. It was in the course of these duties that I helped uncover the dreadful facts which we now call the Holocaust. Early on, I interrogated a top member of Kaltenbrunner's staff, a man named Otto Ollendorf, and asked him what he had done during the war. He replied that he had been in charge of Office 3 of the RSHA except for the year 1941. Naturally, I asked him what he had done during that year. He replied, in 1941, I was the chief of Einsatzgruppe D. 
I had acquired some information on the atrocities committed by these special units and was inspired to ask, well, Ollendorf, how many men, women, and children did your group kill that year? And he answered, 90,000. After this admission, we were able to develop how four Einsatzgruppen operated in the Eastern Territories, rounding up Jews and murdering them, men, women, and children in any tank ditches and in the open fields. Ollendorf testified at the trial and was questioned from the bench by the Soviet judge, General Nikolchenko. Question, in your testimony, you said that the Einsatzgruppe had the object of annihilating the Jews and commissars. Is that correct? Answer, yes. Question, and in what category did you consider the children? For what reasons were the children massacred? Answer, the order was that the Jewish population should be totally exterminated. Question, including children? Answer, yes. Question, were all the Jewish children murdered? Answer, yes. We introduced an exhibit showing the thousands of Jews murdered in the Baltic states by Antichrist A. Estonia was marked Judenfrei. The numbers killed in other states were enclosed in caskets, although to be sure, not one of these thousands of victims received a decent burial. Shot in the open fields, their corpses were simply thrown into anti-tank ditches or mass graves. An affidavit of Hermann Gravy, the manager of a German construction firm in the Ukraine, was introduced in evidence. My foreman and I went directly to the pits. Nobody bothered us. Now I heard rifle shots in quick succession behind one of the earth mounds. The people who had got off the trucks, men, women, and children of all ages, had to undress upon orders of an SS man. A father was holding the head of a boy about ten, hand of a boy about 10 years old and speaking to him softly. The boy was fighting his tears. The father pointed to the sky, stroked his head, and seemed to explain something to him. At that moment, the SS man at the pit shouted to his comrade. The latter called off about 20 persons and instructed them to go behind the earth mound. I well remember a girl, slim and with black hair, who, as she passed close to me, pointed to herself and said, 23. I walked around the mound and found myself confronted by a tremendous grave. People were closely wedged together and lying on top of each other so that only their heads were visible. Nearly all had blood running over their shoulders from their heads. Some of the people shot were still moving. Some were lifting their arms and turning their heads to show they were still alive. The pit was already two-thirds full, I estimated, that it already contained about a thousand people. This was the work of the Einsatzkommandos, to follow the German armies as they advanced on the Eastern Front, seizing Jews from their homes and taking them and other Nazi undesirables into the fields to be murdered. But as the war progressed, the Nazis found need for permanent installations to house, exploit for labor, and ultimately to murder uh, these victims of Nazi insanity. Concentration camps already existed to imprison perceived enemies of the state. Now something more formidable was required, extermination centers to eradicate the unwanted who had not been killed in the fields. The extermination camps were Treblinka, Sobibor, Meidnik, Chelmo, Belzec, and Auschwitz. Of them all, Auschwitz murdered the most. The British Broadcasting Company recently produced a multi-part series on Auschwitz concentration camp, which was shown in the United States on the History Channel. I appeared in the film for the purpose of describing the Commandant 
of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hirsch, whom I interviewed at Nuremberg. Rudolf Hirsch was born in Baden-Baden and raised in Mannheim. His best friend was a black pony, which his parents gave him on his seventh birthday. And his greatest joy was to take his pony into the forest, riding alone for hours on end. Rudolf had two younger sisters whom he would tease as any boy would do. He was a good student in school and an obedient son. Shortly after the death of his father, World War I broke out, and Rudolf became interested in a military career rather than in the religious service which his father had planned for him. He served with distinction in Turkey and the Middle East and headed a cavalry unit in Damascus when the armistice was declared. His unit refused to surrender and fought its way back to Germany. Hirsch joined the Freikorps Rossbach, an extra-legal military unit. In 1922, he was involved in the murder of a suspected communist spy and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He was released under the Amnesty Act of 1928. Hirsch decided to become a farmer and joined an austere agricultural community known as the Arnamana. He married a woman of similar interests. They had five children. Hirsch had joined the Nazi party in 1922. Shortly after Adolf Hitler was named Chancellor of Germany in 1933, Hirsch applied for membership in the SS under Heinrich Himmler and was accepted as a member in 1934. Himmler, who had likewise joined the Arnemann organizations, urged Hearst to apply for a leadership role in the administration of concentration camps. Hearst was intrigued and accepted the offer. He was assigned to Dachau in 1935 and to Sachsenhausen in 1938. He was selected to open a new camp at Oswiecim, Poland, in the summer of 1949, 1940. The German name of the camp was Auschwitz. He had no idea that it was destined to become a site for extermination. In the summer of 1941, Heinrich Himmler called Hearst to Berlin, where he told Hearst that he was to convert Auschwitz into a facility for the destruction of Jews who would be sent there by Adolf Eichmann, head of the Jewish section of the Gestapo. Himmler explained to Hearst that if the Germans did not destroy the Jews in the course of the war, Germany would be destroyed by the Jews. Hearst told me that he actually believed this absurdity. He returned to Auschwitz. The thought of not complying with the draconian order never occurred to him. He built Auschwitz into the foremost extermination plant in history, in which he told me two and a half million human beings had been exterminated. How was this done? Picture this tragedy of murder by the millions. A train pulls into the siding at Birkenau, the primary Auschwitz extermination center, an engine and 30 cattle cars jammed with Jews. It is met by SS officers and guard dogs. The doors are opened and exhausted men, women, and children stumble out. They are told to leave their belongings behind. Able-bodied men and women without small children are directed to line up to the right. All others, women and children, aged and infirm, stand to the left. The latter are to be taken directly as they are informed to the showers. When they arrive at the assigned building and enter, they are told to remove shoes and clothing, carefully hanging the latter on numbered pegs. The door to the communal shower room opens. Apprehensively, they enter, mothers holding their children's hands. For a moment, they are frightened, but are reassured when they observe the shower heads in the ceiling of the room and men of the soldier commando who accompanied them. The latter soon leave, however, sealing the door behind them. Fear returns. 
In a moment, the shower heads activate. They reach out for the water, only to realize to their horror that gas is spewing out. They scream and try to reach to the barred door. Children cry and fall to the ground to be trampled by their ghastly mothers. After a few minutes, the room is a macabre assembly of dead and dying victims, faces distorted in pain, the eyes of little children frozen in fright. Screams of terror give way to the silence of death. Soon all is quiet and the men of the Sonar Commando open the door. They pull out the bodies and trudge them to the elevators, which take them to the furnaces above, where gold rings are removed and gold teeth pulled out of the corpses. The corpses are burned in furnaces and ashes scattered upon the ground or dumped in a stream to be carried to the sea. This was not a crime of the Sonar Commandos, who were themselves Jewish and would soon take their turn in time in the gas chambers. Nor are Rudolf Hirsch alone, follower of the orders of Himmler and the policy of Adolf Hitler, but of 20th century man, under whose rule of the world this incredible crime was committed. Blame not others whose hands committed these crimes. Blame thyself, man of the 20th century, in whose time on earth these dreadful deeds were done. How many innocents died at Auschwitz? Was it four million, as the Russians claim, or three million, as was testified in Warsaw, or two, as First told me, does it matter? A mother weeps equally for the loss of each child as we weep for the Auschwitz victims of the Hitler Holocaust. A thousand years have passed. What was the number killed at Auschwitz? It matters not. It was but a trifle in the history of the massacre of man by man. This world in which we live is subject to the overwhelming fact of force. Nature speaks to us in that idiom. The hurricane that rises from the sea and spreads havoc on the land, the earthquake that shatters the stillness of the day and brings buildings tumbling to the ground, the erupting volcano that sends boiling lava over green fields and quiet homes are forces which nature may unleash in angry mood. Against these forces, mortals have yet to prove their greater power. No one has shown the way to still the voice of the mighty hurricane or quell the mysterious shifts of underlying mountains, or stop the red lava in its flow to the sea. And yet, these forces of destruction do not possess the power to destroy humankind, which human beings themselves have devised. The atomic age burst in fury upon the world. We are caught in the peril of that age. Man-made forces can now destroy man. Perhaps civilization is in its decline and barbarism its due. That will depend upon whether force or law triumphs in tomorrow's world. Thank you. Q&A right now uh, in order to not only stay on schedule, but 
Whitney Hawk, you just can't possibly get any higher than that ending right there. So with that, I'm going to have one more applause for Whitney Hurst. On May 9, 1945, German General Alfred Jodl signed the unconditional surrender of Adolf Hitler's Thousand Year Reich with an incredible request. He said, the German people and the German armed forces are, for better or worse, delivered into the hands of the victors. In this hour, I can only express the hope that the victors will treat them with generosity. Even more incredibly, the victorious allies answered the Nazis' dozen years of unspeakable murder with a compliance to that request. Beyond all reasonable expectation, the despised peoples against whom the Hitler assassins had so brutally sinned rose to a shining hour of reason, justice, and civilization. The Nuremberg trials daunted humanity with its first and only chance to bring to judgment a crime so enormous, so shocking, so widespread, that its sheer scope threatened to overwhelm any hope of prosecution. And the special challenge was to do it not with victor's vengeance, but with the fairness and justice so scorned by the defendants. Autumn, 1945, Nuremberg, Germany. The faint echo of goose steps hangs in air, still heavy with the stench of the dead in the rubble. The Klieglit flags and massed storm trooper banners are gone. The hoarse roar of cheering voices is stilled. The sea of ramrod arms raised in salute has evaporated. And in the wind is the howl of the dead for revenge. In the ruins of Berlin, much of the top Nazi leadership, fearing the rough and ready justice of the approaching Russians, would take refuge in death. Suicide has been the escape of Adolf Hitler, Joseph Goebbels, and the icy SS sadist Heinrich Himmler. But a few already dead monsters at the top would not be enough to satisfy what would be the judgment of the century. There was a, a strong sentiment um, at, at the end of the war, when the Nazi depredations, the atrocities, were revealed to, to carry out drumhead justice, to put the Nazis up against the wall, shoot them. In the United States, the Secretary of Treasury, uh, Morgenthau, uh, felt that uh, this was the right procedure. In fact, uh, Morgenthau advocated that the entire Ruhr Valley be devastated and that Germany be reduced to a purely pastoral or agricultural state. Morgenthau was opposed in the United States by Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson. Stimson believed that the German war criminal should be dealt with only by trial before an international military tribunal. Stimson's view was that to punish these men after a trial would stand better in history. Moreover, that this process would develop a record of Nazi criminality which would stand in history. Stimson's views ultimately prevailed in the United States. The laws of God and of man have been violated and the guilty must not go unpunished. On May 8, 1945, President Truman appointed Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson as the United States Chief of Counsel with the mission of bringing together the four major powers in developing a agreement for the trial of the major German war criminals. He also said that this must be a real trial, not a show trial, not a Stalin trial, but a trial which could result in acquitting a defendant if the evidence did not show guilt. There were hundreds of thousands of foot soldiers, let's say, of Nazism who carried out 
the, uh, the mass executions, operated the gas chambers, shot the hostages, and so on. But what about the top leaders? How did you convict them? None of them uh, shot the bank guard, blew the safe, or drove the getaway car. Their hands were clean. There, there existed no international uh, court. There, inter there existed, at the time uh, they were preparing for the trial, no body of law. There existed no judges. There existed no courthouse. Uh, the, the instruments for trying uh, a drunk driver in any part of the United States were more complete than the instruments for trying mass murderers in Europe at the end of World War II. So they started from scratch. A lawyer in the War Department by the name of Murray Bernays was given the task of devising some kind of philosophy for this trial. Bernays came up with a brilliant idea, uh, which was the conspiracy theory, that the whole Nazi movement was just not simply a po legitimate political movement, but it was a criminal conspiracy designed to seize the territory of Germany's neighbors, to steal from these nations their wealth and their people, and to exterminate their Jews. And this conspiracy theory meant that by being a part of the Nazi leadership, you were part of a criminal conspiracy, and it was a net that held these people. It was agreed that three major types of crimes would be charged against these individuals. The first was the crime of waging aggressive war. The second was ordinary war crimes. And the third, crimes against humanity committed in the course of the war. The indictment would reach unprecedented size with the declaration that the whole Nazi apparatus of repression and aggression would be indicted as criminal as well including the Nazi party leadership, the high command, the Reich cabinet, the Gestapo, the SS with its hundreds of thousands of members and the SA brown shirts whose roles numbered above four and a half million. With harsh irony, the city of Nuremberg, the mystic home place of Nazism, was picked as the trial's location. The courthouse was only a mile or so away from the Nuremberg Stadium, where Hitler and Goering and Hess had screamed their defiance of other countries. So it seemed fitting that if a lot of it started there, then it should end there. One of the few almost intact structures was the old Palace of Justice, an imposing building of great size with a commodious cell block and fine security. They took the adversary system of Anglo-Saxon justice used in England and in our country, which meant uh, having a prosecutor contesting a defense counsel. Then they borrowed from the continental system the idea that judges will receive the evidence and make the determination rather than a jury. So you had a hybrid continental and Anglo-Saxon court. Everything new, never tried before. Well, one of the major questions is who's going to be brought to trial? And the British had a list, the French had a list, the Russians had a list, we had a list. At times, that list may have been as long as 100 people. A compromise was reached, and 22 uh, prisoners were indicted. The uh, majority of the defendants were provided by the American side. Why? Because we held most of them. We had them in our POW cages. The Russians were a little bit miffed at this. From his opening statement and on throughout the proceedings, Justice Jackson's startling eloquence would burn the trial into history. That four great nations, flushed with victory and stung with injury, stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captive enemies to the judgment of the law is one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason. The chief defendant stood accused of enough guilt to warrant 20 million murder trials. Even brought to bay, they exuded defiance. Hermann Wilhelm Goering, former Reich minister and number two to Hitler, would prove an unpleasant surprise for the prosecution. Confounding his image as a bloated hedonistic clown, he would spring a steel trap mind and intimidating personal force to boldly rally the accused in the fight for their lives. 
Rudolf Hess, third highest in the original Nazi power bloc, sporadically mined madness. But the Russians had special reasons to want his blood. The slave laborers in the V2 plants, run by armaments minister Albert Speer, died at the rate of 108 per day. It is hard now to perceive in these miserable men as captives. Jackson's scathing tongue labeled the accused mercilessly. Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop was the salesman of deception. Party philosopher Alfred Rosenberg, Nazism's intellectual high priest. Walter Funk, the banker of gold teeth. Hitler youth leader Balder von Schirach, the poisoner of youth. Fritz Sockel, cruelest slaver since the pharaohs. He might have gone on. Seiss Inquart, hangman of Holland. Frank, Jew butcher of Krakow. Stryker, merchant of hate. Frick, perverter of law. Bormann, Fritsch, von Neurat, Schacht, Dönitz, and Rada conspirators of international murder. It would be what England's Lord Burkett would call a duel to the death between the representative of all that is worthwhile in civilization and the last surviving protagonist of all that is evil. With the bitter emotions of the Nuremberg trial about to break loose, a nervous occupation army built up security. There were fears at a couple of occasions that there might be remnants of the SS that would organize and try to take the prison. At various points in the trial, tanks would be surrounding the courthouse. There would be riflemen on the rooftops because they didn't know what the attitude of the German people were going to be. And the interesting thing is that the attitude was one of almost total indifference. The German people at this point were shattered their cities lay in ruins. They were looking for a bar of soap, something to eat, a crust of bread. They couldn't have cared less what was going on in that uh, courthouse in Nuremberg. An American colonel, Burton Andrus, a humorless, Nazi-hating disciplinarian, took charge of the prisoners. He happily put the corpulent Goering on a strict diet that shrunk 80 pounds off his five foot six inch frame. After the suicides by hanging of second-rank prisoners Robert Lee and Leonardo Conti, guards glared steadily into the lighted cells through watch ports day and night. Chairs were not permitted within four feet of walls, and prisoners' hands had to be in view at all times. Talking to guards and any exchange of military courtesies were prohibited. Some prisoners reported Andrus appearing in their nightmares. There were four prosecution teams at Nuremberg, reflecting the four major powers running the trials. Heading the prosecution along with Robert Jackson were a crack British team led by Sir Hartley Shawcross, British Attorney General, and his deputy, Sir David Maxwell Fife. France sent Champetier de Ribe, former French Under Secretary of State, and Russia Lieutenant General Roman Rudenko, chief prosecutor of the Ukrainian Republic. Justice Jackson was not only the leader of the American prosecution staff, he was really the inspiration for this entire trial. The privilege of opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world imposes a grave responsibility. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant and so devastating, that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. Jackson had worried about a dearth of evidence he hadn't counted on the German character. Evidence arrived in mountains. One of the things that we associate with the German character is an orderliness, a fastidiousness about record keeping particularly. 
the, the thump of the rubber stamp on the document is a very Teutonic sound. During the course of the Nazi regime, uh, th this quality of character persisted. And virtually everything that these people did was documented. 47 crates of binders, 3,000 pounds of Nazi party records, tons of diplomatic papers, 12 volumes of secret foreign policy conference records, and miles of film poured in. Jackson decided to switch his prosecution away from witnesses. As things went along and we uncovered all these interesting documents which were so incriminating of the defendants, Justice Jackson made the statement that perhaps it could be mainly a, a documentation trial. Dead set against this was the colorful General William Donovan. He was head of the Cloak and Dagger OSS and a hugely decorated hero of two wars who had gathered much of the evidence. General Donovan felt the trial would not have a real impact unless there were live witnesses on the stand being interrogated, telling it like it was. He thought that was the way to capture public attention. Jackson would have his way, and the violently opposed Donovan would quit the trial, taking much needed talent and expertise with him. Germans were free to choose any lawyer they wanted, and they did, including unregenerate Nazis who might have belonged in the dock themselves. The defendants had, in effect, a guilt-edged defense. Any poor uh, defendant in an American court today would be lucky to have the quality of defense because some of these people were top lawyers in Germany. Some of them went on to fabulous careers in the years following the war. The primary defense of the German lawyers at Nuremberg on the question of aggressive war was that the charge was ex post facto. They argued that never before had any head of state been called upon uh, to answer the crime of waging aggressive war and that there was no juridical basis for this charge. Sir Hartley Shawcross replied, I suppose the first person ever charged with murder might have said, now see here, you can't do that. Murder hasn't been made a crime yet. The tribunal said, the very idea that states commit crimes is a fiction. Crimes are always committed by persons. Men who exercised great power cannot be allowed to shift their responsibility on the fictional state which cannot be produced for trial. Now the accused filled the court with their firm cries. Not guilty. Hermann Goering was the leader of a group of defiant defendants. At Nuremberg, his philosophy was, these people are not going to exonerate us. This is victor's vengeance. They won, so we're in the dock. And uh, we can go belly crawling, which I'm not about to do, or we can hold our standard high, and we can go down with, with the swastika flying. He took that attitude, and his carryover influence from his position in the Third Reich was still effective over many of these defendants. He was able to dominate them, to, uh, to frighten them, to intimidate them, and had a good deal of leadership throughout the trial. There was a problem big enough to swamp the trial. How to make the words of the court and defendants comprehensible to one another and to the world. An American judge and an English judge speaking, of course, English, a, so a Soviet judge speaking Russian, and a French judge speaking French. Three languages there. The defendants were German. They had to be questioned in German, in their own tongue. So IBM had an idea. IBM suggested some equipment that they were working on which would provide something that we take completely for granted today, instantaneous translation. And one of the most successful recruiting grounds for interpreters were international telephone exchanges. These people were used to working very quickly with language and had very practical knowledge. The most difficult and noble task of the prosecution was not to center the case upon the most lurid of the German atrocities and go for the patient, brilliant assembly of an airtight case built on the conspiracy. 
the greater goal was to convict the whole machinery of aggressive war on behalf of the humanity it had ravaged. In January 5, 1937, in a secret meeting with his top political and military leaders, Hitler had announced that it was his intention to solve the German space problem, that this could only be solved by force, and that the only question was when and how. And from that secret meeting on, Hitler continued to plot his eventual assault upon Europe. Again and again, the eyewitnesses and documents brought Hitler's own damning words. It is my unalterable decision to squash Czechoslovakia by military action in the near future. It is the job of the political leaders to bring about the militarily and politically suitable moment. The world now looked in on a chilling series of top meetings with Hitler, von Papen, Goering, Frick, Keitel, Jodl, von Ribbentrop, and the rest. Where the Sudetenland, Czechoslovakia, and Austria were subjected to secret, merciless threats of military annihilation to make their fall to the Germans seem a desire from within. The prosecution traced back the carefully forged chain of criminal moves. The trumped up evidence of the Reichstag fire to create crisis. The orchestration against perceived enemies of the Reich, trade unions, the churches. Beginning with the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, Jackson dug into the campaign against the Jews, the legislation destroying their property and civil rights their systematic exclusion from professional, cultural life and education, ending with vandalism, violence, and imprisonment on the way to calculated war and murder. Goering had summed it up. He said, I would hate to be a Jew in Germany today. Continuing to weave the net of a conspiracy against peace at the expense of the more sensational and easily grasped atrocities, Prosecutor Robert Jackson pressed doggedly through the aggressive war charges. One by one, he documented the incriminating secret maneuvers of Adolf Hitler, each aimed at naked aggression and provable by a trail of evidence. Documents under Hitler's signature read, no question of sparing Poland. We are left with the decision to attack Poland at the first suitable opportunity. He would say, I am only afraid that at the last moment some Schweinhund will make a proposal for mediation. The details that emerged were dry but unmistakable. How the men in the dock had cynically, murderously pushed an entire world toward devastation. The evidence showed that military destruction had not been enough for the Nazis. Plans in place set in motion a systematic annihilation of intelligentsia, nobility, and clergy. The Jews and gypsies would have their own hideous attention, losing six million and five hundred thousand lives, respectively. Directives were found that invited the lynching of allied airmen without interference from the police. Other decrees ordered labor czar Fritz Sokol to deliver five million captive workers into slavery that was often a death sentence. A Nacht und Nebel, or night and fog order, had the promotion of pure terror at its roots. People disappeared forever without charge or trial. The conspiracy spiraled with attacks on Norway, Denmark, Holland, Belgium, France, Greece, Yugoslavia, and Russia. Jackson pointed out that Germany never declared war under international rules, but struck always without warning and always against the sign assurances of treaties. Goering would later boast that the Nazis had considered your treaties just so much toilet paper. All this conspiratorial horror, wrung from dry paper, would come to light separately from the graphically presented terrors of the genocidal death camps. 
the prosecution would show a film called The Nazi Plan, based on early German propaganda films and meant to demonstrate that they had planned aggression from the first. Its effect on the defendants was electric and jocular. Chirac thrilled to his marching Hitler youth. Goering gleefully shouted the name of each plane and pilot he recognized. He whispered, even Justice Jackson will want to join the party now. Schacht, watching his war production glorified, asked, can you see anything wrong with that? An awed von Ribbentrop breathed, couldn't you just feel the force of the Fuhrer's personality? The mood of the defendants changed sharply when the film turned to the cruel and humiliating kangaroo court trial of those accused in the bomb plot against Hitler. As the Nazi prosecutor screeched abuse, the accused at Nuremberg soberly contrasted the vicious justice of the Third Reich with the even-handed tone of their own trial. Jackson, the brilliant rhetorician, was less skilled in the court remarks of cross-examination. His shortcomings were often shared by lesser prosecutors who became tangled in droning details. World interest waned. The fear of, of Justice Jackson was that the moral authority would just leak out of this trial as it dragged on and on and on. In the end, it lasted 11 months. He attempted to try to stifle the uh, amount of just sheer paper that the German defense could introduce. Jackson began to see the International Military Tribunal as foes arrayed against him. Especially vexing were his fellow American Francis Biddle and the Englishman, Sir Jeffrey Lawrence. Lawrence wanted to rob the defendants of any capacity to claim that they weren't given a, a complete defense. Goering has just testified uh, on his own behalf, and then he's being cross-examined by Justice Jackson. This is the dramatic high point, and everyone is waiting to see how the champion of justice and democracy deals with the, the champion of Nazi evil. And I want to get what's necessary to run the kind of a system that you set up in Germany. Goering has a leg up in this thing because Justice Lawrence keeps ruling that Goering must be allowed to say as much as he wants to say. The usual rules of cross-examination are that, that the prosecutor is able to, to crowd the witness, to keep pushing him with relentless questions towards a trap and then spring the trap. But when Goering could virtually deliver lectures on the political science of Nazi Germany, Jackson was never able to crowd him like that. Goering's two-and-a-half-day diatribe turned the court into a Nazi rally and made him the defendant's hero, like an athlete who had saved the game. Had Jackson made a mistake in not going directly after the most hideous and hateful of the crimes and criminals? Would his great hope for convictions on a cosmic scale allow the main case against war to slip away into its own night and fog? Between the enormous scope of Robert Jackson's indictment American technical miscues in prosecution, and the surprising fairness of the proceedings, the Nuremberg defendants began to believe that they might yet prevail. But now the tide turned with the shocking testimony of the Nazi butchers, who had run the concentration camps and extermination squads. Their testimony jolted the world back to attention. Almost offhandedly, Gestapo officer Otto Ohlendorf made his admissions. How many men, women, and children <clears throat> did you kill during that year? And he answered, 90,000. With that information, we were able to develop that <clears throat> contemporaneously with the German assault against Russia, four special action groups of the Gestapo and SD were sent into the occupied territories behind the German armies with, with a specific purpose of rounding up and killing all Jews and gypsies, intelligentsia that they could get their hands on. The estimate is that two million people were killed by these special action groups. Ferdinand Hirsch was the commandant of Auschwitz. 
Pierce explained his mission in great detail and without any great emotion. He had been called to Berlin by Heinrich Himmler, and Himmler had explained to him that there was a secondary war involving the struggle between the Germans and the Jews, that if Germany did not deal with the Jews at this time, the Jews would certainly destroy Germany. And it was Herse's mission to establish at Auschwitz an extermination center is the most devastating confession of murder by any individual in the history of mankind. The prosecution introduced a film called Nazi Concentration Camps, a compilation of death camp horrors which was assembled by America's noted film director, George Stevens. Many of these scenes were being shown to the world for the first time and produced unimaginable revulsion. Weeping broke out in the courtroom. Women fainted. And time after time, the words of the leaders and followers who had caused it all arose from written records to condemn them. Himmler had summed up the ethic. I did not feel justified in exterminating the men while allowing their children to grow up to avenge themselves. General Yodel said, if we had disobeyed, we would have been arrested, and rightly so. Hearst quoted his boss, Adolf Eichmann, as saying, he would leap laughing into the grave because the feeling that he had five million people on his conscience would be a source of extraordinary satisfaction. The prosecution now began systematically to demolish the wall of just following orders that the high command had tried to build around itself. Prosecutor Telford Taylor would say that men who commit crimes cannot plead as a defense that they committed them in uniform and that military men are not a race apart men above and beyond the moral and legal requirements that apply to others incapable of exercising moral judgment on their own. It was pointed out to Keitel and Yodel that when Field Marshal Erwin Rommel had received the supposedly inviolable order to execute all commandos as captured, he had promptly and contemptuously burned it. Hard-fighting Nazis like Admiral Karl Dönitz would have their victories. In what was known as the Laconia Order, he had directed that survivors of sinkings not be helped in any way by his U-boats. He had a very shrewd lawyer, a German naval lawyer by the name of Otto Kronzbuehler. Kronzbuehler managed to get an affidavit from Admiral Chester Nimitz, a hero of America in the Pacific War, to the effect that the Americans had fought no differently, that in the, in the Pacific we had sunk what was there that we presumed to be an enemy vessel, made no attempt to try to rescue Japanese sailors off of a, an air car carrier that was going down. The tactic would save Dönitz's life. The other allies were startled at how vehemently the Russians demanded the death penalty for the now half-mad Hess. So what was Rudolf Hess doing in that dark? During the, the war, when uh, people were being exterminated en masse in the uh, concentration camps, when hostages were being uh, done away with in batches of a thousand at a, at a time, Rudolf Hess was sitting in a cell in, in England as a result of a chaotic peace flight that he had made in 1941. It was Stalin's rage, pure and simple. He correctly saw the flight by Hess to England as an unforgivable attempt to arrange a separate peace with the English and thus isolate Russia against the German onslaught. An IQ test of the defendants showed the top leadership of the Third Reich averaged a university level 128, ranging from Schacht's high of 143 down to Stryker's dull normal 107. But there was nothing tepid in the intellect of Albert Speer. As German Minister of Armaments, he had wrought wonders of production for Adolf Hitler. He had wept openly at his Fuhrer's death, but emotion was no great part of him. 
the fierce death rate among the 400,000 forced laborers he had demanded from Fritz Sockel, the conscript labor czar, had not turned a hair on Speer's handsome patrician head. But it had put him in mortal danger, and he sought a way to live. Well, Speer was an engineer and an architect uh, who knew how to think through a problem in a very analytical way. And he very clearly had thought through what would work best at Nuremberg, and he read that court very well. They didn't want any more excuses. They didn't want any alibis. They wanted to hear a Nazi get up and say, we're sorry. We did terrible things to mankind. We left a terrible stain. And this, uh, in effect, was the uh, attitude that Speer took in his own defense. To keep the dead slave laborers from putting a noose around his neck, Albert Speer would have to use all the charm and intellect that had endeared him to Adolf Hitler. After long months, the prosecution had invoked the smoke of burning villages, the stench of prison cars, and the groans of the tortured and starved from the dry documents and testimony. They had traced it all back to a conspiracy of corrupt and vicious leaders. The tribunal retired to weigh judgment. In stark coincidence, on the day the prosecution concluded its case, Winston Churchill made his bombshell Iron Curtain speech in Fulton, Missouri, effectively launching the Cold War. And descended across the continent. Well, this is what the Nazi defendants had figured would happen all along, that at some point the West would wake up to the fact that the Germans were not their real enemies, that the communists were their real enemies. And when Churchill made that speech, that seemed to confirm all of their uh, convictions, and they really thought that at this point they could not uh, be convicted, they would not be uh, condemned, they would not be executed. Hess whispered to Goering, you will yet be Führer of Germany. The whole process took oh, perhaps about a month, during which when the judges were in their chambers, they were going over the guilt or innocence of these people. And they did a very conscientious job. On October 1st, 1946, after 315 days of trial, the sentences were pronounced. Hermann Wilhelm Goering, on the counts of the indictment, on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Joachim von Ribbentrop, death by hanging. Fritz Sauko, death by hanging. Julius Streicher, death by hanging. Wilhelm Frick, death by hanging. Hans Frank, death by hanging. Alfred Rosenberg, death by hanging. Wilhelm Keitel, Death by hanging. Ernst Schausenbrunner, death by hanging. Also sentenced to death were Jodl, Seiss Inquart, and Martin Bormann, who was tried in absentia. Hess, Funk, and Rader got life prison terms. Speer, von Schirach, von Neurath, and Dernitz got long sentences. Fritsch, von Papen, and Schacht went free. All indicted organizations except the SA were convicted, as were the general staff and high command and the Reich cabinet. Interestingly, the, um, the defendants at the end of the trial, while they railed at the jurisdiction of the court, that the court had no right to try them, most of them were very grateful and expressed their gratitude uh, for the defense they had uh, received, the latitude of defense that their counsels were granted. The defendants' reactions ranged from cringing to venomous. Fritsch muttered that he was drowning in filth. Frank said, a thousand years will pass and Germany's guilt will not have been erased. But Goering thought that 50 years from now there will be statues of me all over Germany. In the end, Sauko, the slave traitor, received a sentence of death and was hanged. And the slave master, Albert Speer, got a 20-year sentence. Salko was merely doing his bidding, providing the bodies that Speer needed. Salko was a crude, vulgar, lower-class German, not very well-educated. Speer 
was a cultivated German, spoke very good English, very charming manner, and I think very clearly that this played uh, a role in the fact that Zalko was hanged and spirited 20 years and went on to write some very successful books about his experiences in the Nazi regime. With all appeals refused, executions were set for the night of October 16th, 1946. The prison was locked down. The only information allowed in was the inning-by-inning -inning score of the American World Series. The executioner, Army Master Sergeant John Wood, who had hanged 347 men in 15 years, directed his five-man team in setting up three portable gallows in the prison gym. About 11 o'clock at night, the electrifying word came that Herman Goering had committed suicide at the 11th hour, thereby cheating the hangman. Goering had obtained a cyanide cartridge from his luggage, possibly with the unwitting help of a young American lieutenant he had charmed. He died in blue silk pajamas, leaving notes absolving his jailers of complicity. A Russian general slapped the dead Goering's face. Colonel Andrus raged. Nuremberg's delighted in the victory of our Hermann. Joachim von Ribbentrop walked through the door into the execution chamber. He walked to the foot of the 13 stairs leading to the gallows platform. He saw the hangman there with the uh, noose of 13 coils and the hangman's assistant with the black hood. The hangings were botched. Necks did not break as intended. Von Ribbentrop took 17 minutes to die. Yodel, 18. Keitel, 28. Sergeant Woods would never hang anyone again. Stryker died screaming, Heil Hitler. Keitel said, now is the time to join my sons. Speer, von Schirach, and Hess were sent to mop up the blood. Hess paid homage to the carnage with a Nazi salute. Early in the morning, two trucks carried these caskets to Munich, where the bodies were cremated. It is said that in the evening of that day, the urns of the 11 men were carried to the river Isar, and ashes cast into the river, carried down the stream to the Danube, and thence to the sea. Thus ended the Hitler tyranny. Although his absence from Washington had cost Robert Jackson his dream of becoming Chief Justice of the United States, he called his time at Nuremberg the most important and enduring work of my life. Rudolf Hess, at 93, the last inmate of Spandau prison, would end his life after 42 years of confinement by hanging himself. Von Neurath, Dönitz, and others would serve their terms and return to modest, even respected lives in the Germany they had dishonored. Woods, the hangman, was electrocuted in an accident while serving in Korea. The jailer, Andres, died at 85, shouting frantically, Goering has just committed suicide. Nuremberg stands firmly against the resignation of man to the inhumanity of man. This brings us to the point that the really the most important thing that was achieved at Nuremberg was not the conviction of these men and not the sentences imposed, but the determination for history that waging aggressive war is a crime. Since 1945, no avowed Nazi has held significant public office in Germany. From then to 1992, there have been 24 wars between nations and 93 wars of insurgency that killed some 16 million people, many by genocidal methods. More and more, 
the world must turn its hopes to the legacy of the trials at Nuremberg and examine the sturdy instruments of justice forged there for new and inspired use in a world where justice is still too rare. Thank you.